Business Secretary Alex Sharma. Good morning to you, sir. Morning, Julia. Good morning. There is so much to talk about. Uh, I know we uh, want to talk about uh, the issues of these uh, this green industrial revolution, and we will come to that in a moment. But first up, um, do you think that um, it is the government's decision whether or not people can spend time with their families on Christmas Day? Well, Julia, so um, as you know, we've got national restrictions in England right now. Uh, we've been very clear that we will be coming out of national restrictions on the 2nd of December. We will go back into a, a tiering system, depending on where you are in the country uh, and depending on, on what the infection rates are. Uh, and we will set out uh, more details on that closer to the 2nd of December. Uh, the reality is that none of us can predict right now uh, what the infection rate, what the R rate will be uh, in, any diff in, in any part of the country uh, as we get closer to Christmas. I hope, uh, like uh, everyone else, that we will have as normal a Christmas as we can get. It's not a normal year. I think we all accept that. I want to have my mum and dad around the Christmas table. I want to have members of my extended family. But we just have to see where we get to. So I think, frankly, it's too early to say um, where we will end up. Uh, in a month and a bit from now. Uh, it's a bit strange, isn't it, that the government uh, instigated a lockdown policy and going into tears afterwards, which will lots of places feel the same as a lockdown, without knowing what the effect would be. Uh, as we've discussed, and I've discussed with many of your colleagues over uh, recent weeks, there was never a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, we've had computer modelling galore, all of which has been wrong and proven to be wrong so far. And yet the government basically completely you know, kiboxed the, uh, the British economy and took away people's freedoms without knowing what the effect would be. Don't you think it's extraordinary to have a month-long lockdown and not know what effect that would have on the infection rate? Well, uh, Julia, we can see the impact that uh, uh, the, you know, restricting the virus and getting it down has had on the British economy. We see in the latest GDP figures, uh, we're still down uh, over 8% where we were in, in, in February. And of course, uh, you know, huge pressure on, on, on jobs. Uh, uh, there's no doubt that this has had an impact on the British economy. But in terms of modelling, I think it's really very difficult to model uh, individual interventions in different parts of the country. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, as part of that d uh, discussion that takes place, we, we do discuss uh, the impact on the economy. But I, I make this point, and I've said this uh, before on your programme, is that I, I don't think uh, that somehow, uh, uh, you know, uh, supporting the, the uh, NHS, protecting the NHS and protecting the economy are somehow two different things. I mean, you know, if, if we allowed, if we allowed infection rates to grow and we allowed uh, a state where uh, hospitals were being uh, overwhelmed, they're uh, not, that's though. not good news for the country. Well, no, they're, they're, no, but they're not, are they? And it's no, not no, our job to protect the NHS. It's the NHS's no, but, job to protect us. Well, Julia, we've had this, this discussion. We have. Well, 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 to be fair, it's I, Groundhog Day again, Mr no, no, Sharma. Sure, that's I, why we're having I, it again. I, I, of course, understand and, and respect uh, you know, the point of view uh, that, that you're putting forward. But it is also the case uh, that we tried the tiering system. Uh, this was something the World Health Organization said was a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Other countries did. But as we saw the infection rate rise, and, and you saw the stats... No, about, no, no, that, that's not... That's not no, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Uh, uh, sorry. Sorry. That's not true. We actually saw the tier system apparently work because we did see infection rates going down. Infection rates were levelling off and then going down in large parts of the country, most of the country, before we had the lockdown. Well... Uh, so uh, as, as That's I official data. Yeah. Well, as I understand it, what was uh, was happening is that there were parts of the country absolutely where the infection rate was low, but it was growing fast. No, and it had no, no. The official the official data showed infection. The official data is very clear. Infections were either leveling off or going down two weeks before we went into the lockdown. This data yeah. is publicly available. Uh, well, as I said, the decisions were made uh, based on what we knew at the point. I, I, I agree with you that the R rate is coming down across the country. We're now at one. Didn't talk about the R rate. Uh, and uh, that, uh, you know, people are making a, a huge effort. Uh, but that's what we need to keep doing. I mean, you, you talked about a, a normal Christmas. The way we get a normal Christmas, each of us across the country, is we get this thing beaten down. And, and it is, you know, what we cannot do is lose our resolve at this point. We've had some good news on, on vaccine announcements. We've had some good news in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the, the fast testing okay. that's taking place in Liverpool and elsewhere. But we still need to do those OK, basic... but we've had, you, you say we've had this good news. Boris Johnson is in, is in uh, self-isolation right now for 14 days. Despite the fact he's had the virus, he's got the antibodies to the virus, an infinitesimally small chance of contracting the virus or infecting other people as a result. We know this from the uh, international figures on confirmed uh, re re reinfections. Five people out of tens and tens of millions. Um, and, and yet he's taken a, a, a rapid test, these lateral flow tests, proven that he is uh, negative. 
Why is it a Premier League footballer can go and kick a ball uh, in, in, in a football match after having tested negative after coming into contact with somebody? But other people, including the Prime Minister, have to self-isolate. Why are they different? And why well, is the Prime Minister not back at work properly? Well, uh, so uh, uh, let me turn this around the other way. Is that if, if the Prime Minister was... I mean, firstly, he is at work. Uh, you know, I've done... Uh, a bunch of Zoom meetings with him yesterday. I'll be taking part in other Zoom meetings with him today. So the idea that he's not working, he's actually working flat out. Um, I think the issue, though, is that uh, if uh, uh, somehow there was an exception made for, for politicians, I'm sure you will be asking me the other question, is that why why is it different for politicians? No, I'm asking why we have a stupid rule. If we've got tests, the whole point of the test was to free us. Mass testing, to just shove everyone in self-isolation, doesn't work. The whole point of the mass testing was to have a test that was reliable and say, no, no, you're not infectious, so you don't have to isolate. I'm saying the rule is stupid. Well, uh, the, the rule currently is 14 days. Um, of course, we keep all of this stuff uh, under review uh, as we learn more, as the mass testing uh, uh, rolls out, the rapid testing rolls out. Uh, so we'll see where we get to. But right now, that's the rule. And I think it's right that the Prime Minister is following it. He should uh, follow the rule if that's the rule. But should that be the rule? The whole point. We, look, either these tests are reliable or they're not. If they're not reliable, let's not spend tens of billions of pounds of taxpayers' money on them. If they are reliable, then why don't we follow the test and then people don't have to self-isolate including the Prime Minister, when they're not a risk to themselves or others? Yeah, as I said, Julia, we, we, we keep all of this stuff under review. When was it last reviewed? Uh, uh, well, this is done on a, on, a, on a regular basis. We look at this based on the evidence that, that's coming up. But, uh, you know, you, you've made the point quite rightly is that we've got this rapid testing that's ongoing. Uh, we're going to be rolling that out, uh, 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 piloting that across other parts of the country other than, than Liverpool. Um, so let's see where we get to. But the rule right now is 14 days and the Prime Minister quite rightly is adhering to it. Yeah, uh, but the, again, there's no, point, there's no point getting tested if you don't, it doesn't give you any freedom. Let's talk about the other big announcement today because I know that uh, last uh, 19th of December last year when all the Tory voters and people from the Red Wall, the la long-time Labour voters, turned out for, to vote for Boris Johnson to get into office, what they were crying out for, it was the talk of everywhere, every pub, every home, on every doorstep, everyone was saying, what we really want is a ban on the sale of new petrol and diesel cars from 2030. Um, why is that policy being announced today? Well, what they were all uh, uh, talking about was uh, the promise to level up across the country. And if you look at where we have uh, manufacturing of cars and where we will have uh, uh, gigafactories, uh, that is in parts of the country, in the Midlands and, and, and uh, uh, elsewhere, uh, where we want to have our levelling up agenda. If you look at offshore wind, Scotland, North East, uh, if you look at uh, where we want to have our carbon capture uh, and storage clusters, again, that's in places like Merseyside, the Humber, uh, in North Wales and Scotland. Uh, so you're absolutely right. What people voted for uh, was levelling up. People voted for uh, better paid jobs, high quality jobs. And that's what the Green Industrial Revolution is going to deliver. Did, did, they, did they vote for and were they demanding and clamouring for the second biggest purchase that they will ever make other than their home to have no resale value? Uh, were they asking to pay extra for, petrol, for an electric car? Were they asking for their taxes to go up to fund uh, the, the, all the subsidies towards uh, those cars? And, and were they asking for all the, every single good that they buy from the supermarket to clothing that is transported using vehicles which will soon have to all be electric that cost far, much, far more? for those prices to go up. Is that what they were voting for as well? Because I don't remember that being something that they were told before the 19th of December. Well, I, I think, Julia, people uh, understood, and we made this clear in the, in the manifesto, that uh, we were very keen on green growth. Uh, in fact, over the last 30 years as a country, we've managed to grow our economy by 75% and yet cut emissions by 43%. Uh, you will have seen uh, in, in some of the papers this morning uh, the impact uh, of uh, uh, car pollution, or 20% uh, of uh, emissions in our country come from cars and vans, and you see the impact on people's uh, health as a result of that. So I think people do understand that actually they do want to have a cleaner environment. And of course, you're absolutely right in terms of, of, uh, of the cost of buying an electric car. Uh, currently, we're not at, at parity, but uh, you know the, the cheapest electric vehicle you can get right now is a is a smart uh, car about twenty thousand uh, pounds. You can't Nissan. fit a family in a, in a little well, 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 in one of those. You're looking at well over thirty. 
for sure. So if you look at a Nissan Leaf just under £30,000, uh, we also are providing additional money, uh, an additional uh, extra almost £600, uh, £600 million pounds, uh, for uh, a grant of up to £3,000 when people buy these vehicles. Um, so, and, and again, this, and this is where a lot of my listeners will say, what are you talking about? By definition, anyone buying a new car is someone who's well off. I've never bought a new car in my life. I think it's an insane thing to do. You're, you're basically giving taxpayers money to well-off people to buy a new car, three grand's no, I, worth. Do you no, really think that's a priority yeah, for people no, right I, now? I, I don't. I, I don't. I don't accept that. I, I think don't people, accept what? I, well, a bit, you know, we've got 33 million cars on the road right now. Um, you know, people uh, from all walks of life buy cars they will buy them on finance uh, some may buy them outright the very majority what, what was what was the percentage of electric cars sold this last year isn't it down, isn't it about two percent uh um it, well actually uh, new cars it's about two percent isn't it uh yes i mean uh, right now we've got uh, around a hundred thousand sort of pure uh, uh battery uh, uh, ev cars uh, on the roads right now but that's exactly the point in terms of pricing is that uh, you know we're putting half a a, a billion pounds into building up uh, gigafactories which produce batteries in terms of money going into the supply chain. All of these are jobs being created outside the southeast in parts of the country that we want to level up. And of course, the other issue that people have uh, is with regard to can I charge my car up? Uh, so we're putting £1.3 billion into making sure that there are more charging stations around the country, particularly rapid charging. £1.3 billion. 84% 84 of councils have no on-street parking, uh, um, on-street charging points at all. 83%. Um, how, I mean, £1.3 billion. How many is that per charging point for each car? Yeah, so, I mean, uh, uh, th that would be money that's made available for uh, you know, individual homes, but also offices and, and motorways. So right now, we've got about 3,500 uh, fast charging uh, stations across the country. This will add another 6,000 of those. And going back to that how point... Many, about, and how many cars are there? Uh, well, Julie, just, can, may, may I just take this point about pricing of, of cars? Because I think it's a very important point that you raise. So if you look at uh, the, the development in terms of the price of electric vehicles, uh, the expectation is that we will get to parity uh, with diesel and petrol by the middle of the 2020s, and we will be able to accelerate that because of the economies of scale that we get in terms of manufacturing. I mean, this is an opportunity for us in our country uh, to build a sector uh, for export. Uh, this is about uh, you know economy of the future, it's about jobs of the future. I think there'll be very many people listening to your program who'll be applauding that. Well, I'm so for your sake, just finally, let's talk about PPE. National Audit Office report today, very damning, about £80 billion pounds worth of contracts awarded uh, during the pandemic, largely for PPE. Contracts awarded to suppliers. If you had a connection to a government figure or, or a Tory MP, you basically got uh, fast-tracked, more likely to have a, uh, your contract by 10 times approved. We're talking about contracts, no transparency, no competitive tendering, often paperwork done after the fact, millions of pounds handed out to people who had no experience uh, and no business even in existence until the day before they applied. Um, we understand there was an emergency. We understand there was an international market. But do you think that when it's all said and done, uh, this is this has been the right way to handle the uh, the purchase of huge amounts of PPE? Well, Julia, I mean, I remember coming on your programme and other media programmes at the time when we were at the height of the, the, the pandemic, when there was a, a real scramble to get PPE. And in fact, every government across the world was yeah. scrambling to get PPE, right? And quite rightly, you were saying to me and others, where is the PP? Where is the PP to protect the front line? Absolutely right. And therefore, we had to move at pace. The NAO report acknowledges that we had to move at pace. Um, and in terms of the contracts, around seven billion of this was uh, awarded to suppliers who are on framework contracts. So they would have been through the con competitive process. And indeed, every every contract that was awarded, as I understand, there was an eight stage process to assess it, to process the, the, the offers itself. And, and this point about, uh, uh, you know, uh, ministers, etc. The NOA has has acknowledged as well that, um, you know, ministers properly declare their interests. They were not involved in uh, any procurement decisions or individual contract management. And that's right and proper. We will publish, as we always do with public contracts, uh, they'll be published in, in, in due course and people can have a look at the, for, for themselves. Well, I share they will make their own judgment. Thank you very much. Really appreciate you joining us. Business Secretary Alex Sharma went through a, a lot of topics there. Uh, if you appreciate that, just breaking news for you. I mean, it's just become laughable now. Dido Harding, the woman in charge of our test and trace system, uh, her app has pinged and she's now having to self-isolate for 14 days. Presumably she'll also have a test proving that she's negative today and in the next few days, but she'll still self-isolate because we've got an absurd rule.
uh, an absurd rule that doesn't actually free people with testing. I don't know what the point of testing is if it's not to make sure we isolate the people who are at risk and free the people who are not.